I am here with Dr. Nick Bird. Super excited to have a philosopher scientist talking with me today. I'll just start by turning it over to you. What's your newest, latest idea? So lately, uh, I've been working on researching the COVID-19 pand pandemic and some of the moral and philosophical um, things involved in the pandemic and people's response to it. We, uh, we did some research where we looked at what predicts people's compliance with the public health recommendations that we've all heard about, like washing your hands and wearing masks and staying at home and, and the like, uh, and found some interesting stuff, not, 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 not necessarily what we expected. Like uh, we didn't find that the various types of public health messages that you've seen made much of a difference. Hmm. It didn't seem like people's reasoning ability made much of a difference, but people's prior philosophical beliefs seemed to predict quite a bit of variance in how much people wanted to wear masks or how much they expected that they would wear masks and wash their hands and do the rest as well. So I'm curious, how did you gather the evidence you gathered? What was your method, I guess? Yeah, so uh, we did some online experiments of people who are uh, adults in the US who are fluent in English, uh, about a thousand people between the two experiments that we ran. And these are more or less uh, survey experiments, right? So there's an online survey and then within the survey, there's some randomized assignment to different conditions so that we can test the effect of these different conditions. Uh, uh, so this online experiment thing is, is pretty common in my field in general, but it was particularly handy during the pandemic where you know, I couldn't go to people and, and, and collect the data in person, right? I actually had to shut down some of my in-person data collection. So most of this, well, really all of this uh, that I'm referring to was done online. So you're telling me that there's something about someone's philosophy and their, their reasoning that affects whether they react and listen to health recommendations. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, so you could kind of think about people's response to the pandemic uh, restrictions and, and uh, and policies as a sort of dilemma, right? So um, on the one hand, we're worried about millions of people suffering and dying. We don't want that, that's bad. So that's one horn of the dilemma. And on the other hand, we have these restrictions that maybe we're not crazy about, like we have to wear a mask and that's annoying and we have to maybe cancel that restaurant reservation or worse, like our vacation or, um, you know, other types of things that we don't want either. So there's these two things that we don't want. We don't want millions of people to suffer and die, but we don't want to give up our vacation. We don't want to have to, you know, stop eating out. And so we have to pick which one we want to pick, uh, we want to do. Do we want to prioritize these millions of people or do we want to prioritize our desire to do these things like not wear masks and, and go out and, and you know, uh, the rest. And it turns out that people's philosophical preferences predict what they'll do in this dilemma about the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And so some of these preferences are like moral preferences uh, or uh, people's beliefs about science. What would be a, a moral preference when you say that? What exactly do you have in mind? Yeah, so one type of preference you might have is, um, I guess, what matters when you're thinking about what you ought to do, right? So. Uh, when you're thinking about it, this dilemma, what I, what I, what ought I do? Should I stay home and wear the mask and wash my hands and blah, blah, blah? Or um, should I not, even though it puts these millions of people at, at risk? You might think, well, if I'm the only person that matters, or if my liberty is the only thing that matters, then I'm going to do what I want. And if I want to not wear a mask, I'm going to not wear a mask. But if you think actually everybody matters, not just me, but you know everybody, then you might think maybe I can't always choose to do just what I wanna do because there's consequences for other people and those consequences seem to outweigh the, the negative consequences of millions of people suffering and dying. And that outweighs whatever the negative consequences are that I would experience by wearing a mask when I don't want to or giving up the restaurant reservation or canceling my vacation. That's interesting. So it sounds like the two sides that you were talking about one if we choose one we're going to be ethical egoists 
which tells us something like you should do whatever is good for you, no matter what. And you should prioritize yourself. And it sounds like on the other horn, as you put it on the other side, the other thing we that we might do is something like a utilitarian would do, which is to value everybody involved. So you're saying something like through research, through looking at a thousand people, you found out that when it comes to actually putting themselves first or everybody else first, even if it means that they don't come first, that those prior philosophical thoughts will affect what people actually do more so than what the CDC said or what the government said or what the public rules are. That, that's really interesting. Does that tell us something about human nature or moral psychology? How, how we reason? The fact that like what the government and the Center for Disease Control says doesn't matter more than what we thought before we even had the problem? Yeah, it does seem, I'll, I'll admit that this was a sort of surprising finding for me. I expected the various experimental conditions about messaging to affect people's outcomes, right? Um, and I, I'm happy to explain those uh, at some point, but um, they're in the most recent paper if people wanna, wanna look at it. But so I expected the different types of messages that you, you would see during this pandemic to have some sort of impact. Um, I also expected like people's reasoning ability to different to, to matter, right? So you might think some people are just better able to grasp how like exponential growth works and uh, therefore like better able to understand the, the severity of the threat of something like a pandemic. And um, so if, if you're not as good or, or used to understanding things like exponential growth curves, then like the threat of the pandemic just might not be as serious to you. So I thought those things would matter, but they didn't in our data. And what instead mattered was uh, people's belief with particular principles. And um, one of the principles was, comes from a, a paper by philosopher Peter Singer called Famine, Affluence, and Morality. And in this paper, he has a premise in his argument that goes something like, if you can, I'm paraphrasing, but it's, it goes something like, if you can prevent great harm without causing as much harm, then you ought to do so. Mm. Um, and the more, the more that people agreed with this principle, the more likely they were to comply with public health recommendations. And that agreement with that principle predicted more compliance with public health recommendations than anything else we tested. Um, and we tested about a dozen different uh, philosophical items and uh, with some reasoning tests and like I said, some messaging conditions. So yeah, what, what I think this tells us is that, um, you know, my intuitions about this weren't great. Uh, what I expected to find, I, I didn't necessarily find. I did expect that people's moral inclinations would be relevant, like they would predict some of the variants, but I didn't necessarily think that they would predict more variants than anything else in both experiments. So one thing I'm thinking, um, well, I guess I should back up just real quick and say that the other thing that predicted flouting these public health recommendations, that is it predicted non-compliance with public health recommendations is, uh, people's response to the following question. What matters more for a good society, liberty or equality? And the more that people thought that liberty was important, the less likely they were to comply with mask wearing and, and staying at home and, and things like that versus uh, caring about equality. Uh, the more that people cared about equality, the more that they uh, were likely to comply with public health recommendations. So there's, there's two kind of moral preferences that seemed to predict variance in people's compliance. And interestingly, those two uh, moral preferences were anti-correlated. Uh, so the more that people cared about liberty, the less likely they thought that we should prevent great harm whenever we can do so without causing as much harm. Which to me seems to suggest that there are multiple moral preferences involved and they might be in conflict and depending on which one you choose might have an impact on what types of decisions you make during things like pandemics. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, I'll, co I'll comment really quickly on that because there happens to be famous meta-ethical 
theories about this. When, when you're thinking about what a just society looks like, what, what a society living with, with a condition of righteousness, some people are, they're libertarians. And a libertarian theory of justice says that you should do whatever protects your individual freedom, no matter what. And on the other hand, a contradicting theory is the egalitarian theory of justice, which says that the rich should give up their money to the poor to make everyone more equal. The righteous society is the society where there is the smallest gap between people. And you're saying that whether someone is egalitarian or a libertarian affected the pandemic, and also that there seemed to be a correlation between um, if someone was libertarian, they would be more likely to be an ethical egoist and refuse to wear their mask and refuse to stay home. Th that's really interesting to me. And it, it makes me happy that philosophy is actually being seen as relevant here. And I do want to welcome you to tell us more about the messaging conditions. Could you can you explain that for us, please? Yeah. So early in the pandemic, I was finding myself puzzled why there were kind of an alarming number of people who thought these masks aren't that important to wear. Um, and, you know, staying at home isn't that important. And so I found myself like wondering why, like, why aren't people motivated to, to care about these millions of people who, who could suffer and die? And so I started thinking about the way that leaders were talking about this, right? And so one of the messages we saw a lot of were these flatten the curve graphs, right? Where there's like two big humps on a graph and there's this big, tall, scary hump that represents how many people are gonna die um, if we don't do anything, if we just continue life as normal, you know, pre-2020 normal. And then there's this like smaller, less scary, more optimistic hump. And that one represents how many people die if we, you know, don't go to restaurants as much and we wear masks and we limit our travel and et cetera, et cetera. And the point of those graphs is to say, we want the low hump. So do whatever you can to, you know, to flatten the curve, this is what they would say. And, you know, I thought maybe statistics like that just aren't that powerful in terms of motivating people, right? They're just numbers. And it seems like I wasn't alone. There were some journalists who were asking questions like, well, what if we focused less on these like statistics and these graphs and focused more on like pictures of people who are suffering and dying or, you know, uh, just like very vivid interviews with families who, who just lost their loved one to COVID-19. And um, so we focus more on like individual victims than statistical victims. And there's a literature on this in psychological research called the identifiable victim effect, where in past studies, people do seem to care more about these identifiable victims than statistical victims. So we had a condition where uh, in, a, in a, some of our conditions, people were presented with graphs, flatten the curve graphs and told like, this is why we need to wash our hands and stay at home, et cetera, et cetera, because we're concerned about these millions of people. And then in the other conditions that we're, we were comparing those to, it was just a picture of a person in a hospital on a respirator with a brief description that like, this is a hardworking parent of three people that you know, we'll leave behind these kids if, if we don't wash our hands and stay at home, et cetera, et cetera. And so we expected that the individual victim, and, you know, this, with this heart-wrenching story about a family would be way more powerful than the statistics and the graphs, and it wasn't. <laughs> um, the other condition that we can, or the other comparison we made in our experimental manipulations was to compare messaging about the COVID-19 pandemic to messaging about a so-called flu pandemic. And this was inspired by various leaders who early in the pandemic, at least, were saying, this is just a flu pandemic and we don't, we don't shut down the, the economy for the flu. We don't all put on masks. Like lots of people die from the flu and we don't you know, totally change the world for you know, the flu. And so we were wondering if we just call, if we called all of these deaths and all of the, uh, the and everything on the graphs and everything about this victim in a hospital, if we, if we kept everything the same, but just said it was a flu pandemic, how would that change people's responses? And that actually did make a difference. What it did is it reduced people's perceived threat of the pandemic. So they thought the pandemic, even though all the numbers are saying millions of people are gonna suffer and die, 
they still thought it's still less of a threat to society. And as a result of that, they, they were less likely to comply with public health recommendations. So this is called an indirect effect in moral psychology or in statistics. You don't need to know the details of that, but in essence, talking about the pandemic as a flu pandemic reduced people's compliance with public health recommendations compared to talking about it as a COVID-19 pandemic. And the explanation is it reduced people's perceived threat of the pandemic. So I guess I've got two responses, one for each of those. It, for the first one, you said that you, you were shocked that the empathy grabbing images of someone sick on a ventilator or something, you, you were shocked that that didn't work more than the logos and the, the logic and the, the graphs. But what ended up, were they the same? Were they equally ignored? Or how did that end up? Yeah, so there's some statistical tests you can run to figure out, like, is this truly equivalent, so to speak? They're called equivalence tests. Um, you know, not to get into those details, but the takeaway from those equivalence tests was this is either so small of a difference between the, you know, statistics versus the individual or identifiable victims. It's so small of a difference that it's either just very small or it doesn't matter. So practically speaking, the effect was very, very small. Now, if you reran our experiment with like three or 4,000 people, you might be able to detect a smaller difference that we couldn't detect with just a thousand. Uh, that would be an extremely expensive study that I frankly don't have the funds to do, but I, I'd be, I would welcome someone to do it. But what you can infer from our data alone is that it's actually not a significant difference. And then one way to just kind of explain that is we ran the same test on whether the differences between the statistical victims and the identifiable victims had any statistical impact on something that couldn't at all be meaningful. And what that was, was we assign every participant a random, like certain digit number. They have to get a random, random number so that when they finish the survey, they can put this number into a certain part of the payment system so that they can get paid for taking the survey. And we found that there was a small effect on that randomly generated number, which couldn't be a causally meaningful impact. So the difference between compl uh, compliance in the statistical victim condition compared to the identifiable victim was as big as this meaningless difference on randomly generated numbers. Okay. Okay, okay so for the second one, um, the second situation here that you described, do you think that as a philosopher scientist, one conclusion we can reasonably draw from the study you just published is that when professionals in advance know that a perceived threat being greater means greater compliance, is it then correct to make the threats perceive worse so that we can actually flatten the curve? I mean, I, I just wonder if that's a conclusion someone's drawing when they read your research oh, we should have made it seem way worse. Yeah, so there's a variety of different directions you could go here. Um, what do you think about that one though? I mean, now that we know um, <laughs> logic doesn't work, <laughs> people don't empathize, uh, but if they're afraid for their own lives, then they'll listen. Now what? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I do think that it does seem reasonable to say we should at least make sure that people understand the actual level of threat, right? So we shouldn't reduce or minimize threat because, you know, some of the justifications for comparing the pandemic to a flu pandemic was to like make sure people weren't scared because if they get scared, then bad things will happen. But it seems like the data show here's a bad thing that'll happen when you compare it to this less scary flu thing. Lots more people might die because the public health precautions aren't being taken. Right. And so you might think we should at least make sure people understand that it's as threatening as it actually is. Mm. But then there's this further question, like, what if we use this to manipulate people's behavior? Like, should we, like, if we want a bunch of people to respond in a certain way, should we like ramp up the perceived threat of things, even if it's like maybe overselling the threat? Yeah, what do you think on that? Yeah, so, you know, I guess normatively there's a few Yeah, I, I'm, I, I would imagine it would be difficult to argue for kind of manipulating people in ways that don't accurately reflect reality. 
Um, but you might think in terms of a consequentialist or utilitarian framework, if the consequences of this manipulation are so important or so significant, then it could justify it, right? So if, if millions and millions of lives are at stake, then you know, deceiving a, uh, a few million people into thinking something slightly more threatening than it actually is could be justified. Mm -hmm. um, but not everyone would accept such a utilitarian calculus, right? So it might depend on your moral view, going back to what you were discussing earlier, right? If, if, you're, if you reject such utilitarian calculus, then you might think, no, you should only communicate as much threat as is, 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 is real. Excellent, yes. And how, how about slightly changing the subject, those people who reacted completely the opposite of what the, um, what the recommendations were saying to do and instead thought that anyone following the recommendations doesn't fear God and is clinging to their life. I, I did see a lot of this kind of stuff uh, in the Midwest where, where I have news coming in, this, this sort of um, belief that all of this is a part of the plan, all of this was predicted in the Bible, that if you're wearing masks, you're afraid, and if you're wearing masks, then you're, you're a sheep, you're just listening to the government. You should listen to yourself. You should listen to God. There is a lot of this kind of rhetoric that was going on. What do you think about that? Or, or does, your, does your research have a way to theorize and explain that kind of reaction? Yeah, so there's two things that we measured in our experiments that could be relevant to this. So one thing we asked people is, do you believe in God? Uh, and they could rate like not just yes or no, but like the degrees to which they believe in God. So we could get a finer uh, measurement of that in case they were th thinking like, you know, some people think faith implies not full certainty, but like uh, something short of that, right? So they think God probably exists even if they're not certain, right? So we were able to capture that in this measure. And then we also asked uh, about people's religiosity and in this experiment or this survey, religiosity was just, um, how much do you participate in organized religion, right? So going to services, um, you know, maybe uh, praying, uh, things like that, whatever organized uh, activities there are related to religion, how much do you do that? So there's both a belief and a practice element. And it turns out that religious practice, the going to the services, the prayer, the being around your community of religious people, that predicted being more compliant with public health recommendations. Um, and believing in God didn't predict as much variance. Um, and sometimes it just didn't have a, a detectable effect. And so you might think, um, based on some of the reporting, I frankly expected a slightly different finding, um, in part because one of the, you know, there's been a few categories of activities that have been considered like high probability to spread the virus, right? So like restaurants and bars and gyms and churches have been on this list, at least in the United States, uh, but also in, in countries like Australia. And so I thought religiosity might predict being less likely to comply, but it didn't in our data. That's what but I've it, assumed also. Yeah. And the, the interesting thing is it doesn't necessarily seem to be the religious beliefs that were explaining this relationship. Otherwise, you know, believing in God would have also predicted quite a lot of variance. It might be something else about religiosity, perhaps like being involved in a particular community or whatever the rituals are that you're participating in. There might be something about that as opposed to just the beliefs. Um, and that, you know, that's interesting to me in, because, um, you know, as a philosopher, I might want to focus more on the beliefs and the arguments for the beliefs and, and what work that does, but it seems like our data suggests that actually there might be something interesting happening in the ritual or in the practice part of religion, which might be, well, to use the words you were using earlier, less about logos and more about something else. Interesting. I went to, for whatever reason, a Presbyterian church during the pandemic um, for an, a reason other than religion itself. And I could hear the sermon that was going on and it began, we're not afraid, this can't get us, take off those masks, only fear God. And so that would make my hypothesis that the people having the beliefs and going through the motions 
would be less likely to follow the recommendations and, and the messages. So that's interesting. One thing you might also think, this isn't necessarily something we can draw from our own data, but there's a, a literature on this in psychology for those who are interested is that there's a literature showing that religious people are, are a bit more sensitive to perceived threat um, in certain situations. And so you might think in a situation like a pandemic, they might actually perceive more of a threat or at least be aware of the threat rhetoric in society about the pandemic. And it seems like your experience kind of jibes with that a bit. And so insofar as religious people are more sensitive to the perceived threat, that might be explaining something that we're observing in our data. And it might even be explaining why people are more likely to comply if they're more religious, because um, perceived threat was one of the be best predictors of complying with the public health recommendations. The more you thought that this threatened society, the more you thought that you should wear a mask and stay at home. And if religious people are more likely to see the threat, then they're more likely to wear the mask and stay at home, et cetera. That's interesting. So connecting this to what you were saying before, rather than the libertarian who wants to uh, value individual freedom, the divine command theorist or the religious person who wants to do what God says, listens to God saying that we should value the community. And if you are religious and you think the source of morality comes from God and you have some kind of duty to your fellow citizens, then you might be more likely to do what's better for the community and to care about others more than the restrictions on yourself. So that we can take that another level and connect that too. It's interesting how you're bringing out through these studies how the theories are all connected to one another and have a pragmatic consequence which could be life or death for an entire nation. That's interesting. Now, briefly going through your study, I, I thought that I would ask you the following question. Is there some kind of analogy between this moral dilemma that we find ourselves in, um, in the pandemic? Do I wear a mask and inconvenience myself, but help everyone? Or do I don't wear a mask and don't con inconvenience myself, but not like, so this kind of moral dilemma you set up for us, what should we do? It tracks a debate about abortion, right? That's, so can you, can you tell us more about that and explain it better than I just did? No, I think, I think you're, you're right on. So um, the, there's people who tend to be left leaning politically, um, insofar as there's a left-right spectrum of, of political preferences, um, who's, who have argued that women should have the right to have control of their own body and what happens to it, and, and the government shouldn't necessarily interfere, right? This is the pro-choice position, so they should choose whether or not they should give birth to uh, uh, a kid or not give birth to, to, that, to that fetus or that kid. Um, and some of the rhetoric around this has been um, about liberty, right? So my body, my choice has been one of the, the standard refrains in this movement um, to allow women to have right about reproductive rights. Um, and, and again, these, these are traditionally left-leaning people in the past. And then during this pandemic, something interesting happened where this rhetoric, this my body, my choice rhetoric was adopted by uh, mostly right-leaning people. And you know they're right-leaning because most of their signs were for uh, a conservative president at the time. And these people had my body, my choice with, a, uh, with other rhetoric about how they shouldn't have to wear masks and they shouldn't have to stay home and these government restrictions are just impinging on their rights. And it's, it's interesting that the conservative uh, people who are protesting this tend to disagree with the people who think we should, uh, that women should have reproductive rights and, and use the my, choice, my body, my choice rhetoric, but they'll adopt the my body, my choice rhetoric when uh, arguing for this other thing that they want that has to do with liberty. And it, it kind of made me wonder how pro-life some of these people might be, right? So the conservative people tend to describe themselves as pro-life and by pro-life, they mean uh, women shouldn't be able to abort a fetus uh, because the fetus has a right to life that shouldn't be violated by the woman. But if, if these people are pro-life uh, about a woman who has a fetus in their body uh, that may not want or have planned that to, for that fetus to be there, um, but they're not pro-life when it comes to protecting millions of people from suffering and death, 
when all they have to do is wear a mask. They don't have to like carry a fetus to term for nine months. They just have to put on a mask. Then it's not clear to me that they're pro-life. It seems like they're actually just pro-fetus or like anti-abortion. And that's really nothing at all like pro-life. I mean, that's a very, very restricted sense of pro-life. Uh, and so it seems like this pandemic has actually brought that out in, in very clear ways. That's really interesting. So you're, you're basically helping explain a number of things, but among them is that somebody's pre-theoretical moral judgments affect whether or not they're going to save other people's lives or, or attempt to do so. And moreover, that when you look at what people should do, given their pre-theoretical judgments, it doesn't always line up with what they think they should do or what, what they actually do. And th this teaches us a lot about our, our psychology, I guess, right? I mean, there, there, that could be one conclusion we draw from your study. Uh, people don't respond to logic. <laughs> people aren't actually empathetic and, res and respond well to seeing the emotional distress of another human being and that people are inconsistent or, or what would you call this last bit of information we learn? Yeah, I guess if, if somebody says that they endorse the my body, my choice rhetoric uh, for not wearing masks, even though it puts lots of people at risk, but they don't endorse it um, when it's you know a woman's right to choose what happens to her own body because of the risk to the fetus, that seems to be a pretty clear contradiction. And, and again, I think the only way to kind of eliminate the contradiction is to, is to change the original position from pro-life to just merely pro-fetus. Uh, then it becomes consistent because in, in the one case, um, that, you know, they don't care about the millions of people suffering and, and dying because they're not fetuses. Um, whereas in the abortion case, they're fetuses. And that's like, that's the special category that they care about. Or you might be able to say, well, they're just anti-abortion, right? So they don't care about suffering and death. They just care about abortion. Uh, so they want to prevent abortion. They don't want to prevent suffering and death. Uh, so that's another way you could make it consistent. But of course, you know, that doesn't have the same ring to it as pro-life. You know, that, that sounds like a lot less... Uh, righteous uh, than pro-life does. Interesting. Thank you. And is there anything that I haven't asked that maybe I should have asked? Is there anything else you'd like to share? Even if it's just your insights, I mean, it sounds like you were surprised that what actually you learned didn't match your hypotheses. So any, any insights you'd like to share with us or, or final remarks? I guess one thought is just that for the, you know, for the aspiring philosophers or those who are interested in philosophy out there, um, I guess I just, I hope they'll, um, if they're interested, become more interested in this thing called experimental philosophy, where we can actually run experiments like the ones where we've discussed here, where we figure out how philosophical judgments work and maybe how they relate to real life decisions like people's decisions about this pandemic. And there's, there's kind of a growing and kind of thriving literature where people actually do psychological experiments and studies to help us better understand how philosophy works uh, and the ways that you've so helpfully pointed out, the ways that the various views might relate to one another, like you know, actual empirical correlations between people's preferences from different philosophical views. We can, we can go out and find those empirically. Uh, and so that's, that's another way to do philosophy.